This is video number uh, 16 from digital-university.org. We are considering different topics in quantum mechanics. And by the way, the playlist for all the videos in this series are not, the playlist is not on YouTube, rather the playlist is at the website, digital-university.org. In um, this video, we want to consider Dirac orthonormalization of the momentum eigenfunctions. And we'll probably have to split the video up into two parts. And this Dirac orthonormalization business, it encompasses a lot of what we've been discussing in the previous videos. So before we get into it, let's just sort of stop and review some of the salient concepts here. Now, what we've established in the previous videos is that both the momentum and position operators are Hermitian. And remember now, Hermitian um, operators are special because even though all the components that are involved might be complex, their corresponding eigenvalues are always real. Now, incidentally, if you have a Hermitian operator or any kind of operator and you're wondering how do you find out what its eigenfunctions and uh, eigenvalues are. Well, in some of our earlier videos we showed how operators and matrices, um, when the operator is, ex is expressed with respect to a certain basis, you get a matrix out of it. And if you go again to the website at digital-university.org, and click on the playlist for the linear algebra series. I think it's videos 15 and 16 where we show when you have a matrix how you can find its corresponding eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Okay, but anyway, back to Hermitian operators. So their eigenvalues are real. Their corresponding eigenfunctions, they're linearly independent, but they have another special property. They're also orthogonal. And since the eigenfunctions are orthogonal, we can also make them be orthonormal. And we had our, a demonstration of that. I think it was in um, video number seven, how when you have an orthogonal function, how you can make it be orthonormal. And that means then that their inner product is the direct or the uh, Kronecker delta here. It's either zero or it's one. When m does not equal n the inner product is zero. When they are equal, it equals one. And remember now that for quantum mechanics, we require that all of the functions in quantum mechanics be square integrable. That is, when you take their inner, when you take their inner function value here, you don't want it to blow up. So I'm just saying here, we just simply want this to be less than infinity. Well, here when you take the inner product, it not only is less than infinity and well behaved, but it's either zero or one for these orthonormal eigenfunctions that we can find to be associated with any kind of Hermitian operator. Another special property that Hermitian operators have, their eigenfunctions are complete. And what that means is, suppose we have a certain um, Hermitian operator and we're just in, say, in three-dimensional space, so that when we represent it as a matrix, we get a three-dimensional matrix, or a three-by-three three matrix. Well, this is Hermitian, so for this matrix, then, what that means is that there would be three linearly independent eigenfunctions associated with that matrix. Not only are they linearly independent, they're also orthogonal eigenfunctions and therefore can be made orthonormal. Well, that means now that any vector in three-dimensional space can be written as a linear combination of the eigenvectors of this matrix here. So if we had, say, a 10 by 10 Hermitian matrix, then we're guaranteed that there will be 10 eigenfunctions, not just 10 different eigenfunctions, 10 linearly independent eigenfunctions, or even more special, 10 orthogonal um, eigenfunctions, 
which can be made orthonormal. So any vector in 10 dimensional space can be written as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions of that 10 by 10 Hermitian matrix. Now, if you have a 10 by 10 matrix that is not Hermitian, there will be some eigenfunctions associated with it, but you're not guaranteed to find 10 linearly independent eigenfunctions. So, but with Hermitian matrix, you do have that guarantee. So that's why we say that the eigenfunctions of a Hermitian matrix, um, they indeed, they are complete. Now, we also, when we discussed um, the position operators as well as the momentum operators, we had some problems though. First of all, for the position operator, which is defined like this, position operator operating on a ket vector, and we can say yes, this ket vector is an eigenfunction for it, it is just simply the coordinate x times that ket vector. Or if we have, say, the position operator and associated with the wave function of the particle here on the x-axis, all that means is, well, it'd be that wave function times the coordinate. And if you remember back in that specific video, that didn't make much sense. And it turns out that the only kind of eigenfunction that would be associated with this was the direct delta function. Now, well, what happens then if we have, say, a position operator, x prime, and let's say there's, we have two different eigenfunctions associated with it. What happens when you take their inner product? What do you get? So here we'd have, well now both of these are real because we're just limiting ourselves to the x-axis. So we take the inner product, we don't have to take the complex conjugate, both of these are real values. So we would have this direct delta function times this direct delta function and now we're integrating. And what do we get out of this? Well let's look. This is, every, is zero everywhere, except when x except when x is equal to lambda. So this would be lambda. So you have the direct delta function of lambda minus lambda prime, and we can take that to the outside of the integral, which we've done right here. And the reason we can is because, well, this is just like a, a constant here when it's inside the integral because we're integrating with respect to x. So we can take this out, then what's left inside is this, and the integral of that is 1. We're not showing that explicitly here because we've already done that in the previous videos. What we want to show then is that for the position operator, the eigenfunctions are direct delta functions. And when you take their inner product, not surprisingly, you get another direct delta function. Well, we just said now that when you have Hermitian operators, their corresponding eigenfunctions are supposed to be this. Let's be nice and neat and orthonormal. Here, we're getting this expression instead. So that's one peculiarity. Another one is that these are the eigenvectors, or the eigenvalues, the lambdas are the eigenvalues of the particular position operator. And what we showed in the previous videos is that these eigenvalues, they just don't have specific values of 1, 2, 7, or whatever along here on the x-axis. They can assume any value whatsoever on the x-axis. So that the eigenvalues are not discrete, they're continuous. So for the position operator, the eigenvalues are not discrete, they're continuous, the eigenfunctions are the direct delta functions, and then when we take the inner product we have these direct delta functions instead of our typical orthonormal expression that we're used to seeing for eigenfunctions associated with the Hermitian operator. Well, what about the position, or what about the momentum operator? We showed in the last videos then that the corresponding eigenfunctions are these. In the last video we showed that when we take 
the inner product of their eigenfunctions, we get this direct outer function again. Now, incidentally, here, if we reverse the order of these, then we reverse the order here in the direct delta function expression. So where we're left right now is this. For the position operator, the eigenvalues are continuous instead of being discrete. The eigenfunctions are these strange direct delta functions, and the inner product is these direct delta functions. For the momentum operator, once again, the eigenvalues are continuous. Here are the eigenfunctions. When you take their inner product, though, we have these Dirac delta functions again. So at the position operator and the momentum operator, in each case, when you take the inner product, we get Dirac delta functions instead of this nice neat expression that we're used to seeing for eigenfunctions that belong to a Hermitian operator. Now, that might make us wonder, well, since they have these strange properties, are the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator and the position operator, are they complete? Since they have these other strange properties, uh, does this hold up? And that's the question that Dirac was um, struggling to answer, and he said, yes, they are, provided that for Hermitian operators, when we have these situations where the eigenvalues turn out to be continuous instead of discrete, and when you're taking inner products, you get this, this then is the new definition of orthonormality. In other words, he's expanding the definition of orthonormality to include these direct delta functions that arise when you take the inner products, both for the momentum operator and for the position operator. And it turns out that if you think of it in these terms here, that that does have um, some rather deep consequences. And that's what we want to explore right now. So let's go to here. Now, what we have is we're saying if we have a complete set of functions and the functions are orthonormal, then that means that any function here can be written as a linear combination of these. Furthermore, if these we can think of these as basis functions. If these are orthonormal, then that means these coefficients here, we know what they are. It's the inner product between any one of these basis functions, if you will, and this function. Take that inner product, and that will tell you what each one of these are. And again, we covered this um, during our very first video. Well, suppose, though, we have a situation where these ends here don't take on discrete values having, you know, f of x is equal to c1 f1 of x plus c2 f2 of x, and so on. Suppose that these ends, instead of having discrete values, 1, 2, 3, etc., suppose they had a continuous set of values. Then can we still make this kind of representation? And the answer is yes, but instead of adding like this, we would have to integrate. So we could say, for example, we could have a function f of x would equal, and say, here we have, say, c of p, and we have another function with p and x, but these don't take on values 1, 2, etc. These are complete, these functions, but these p's take on a continuous set of values. Then what we'd have to do is 
you would have to integrate and integrate with respect to p. Now that makes it a little bit more complicated then because that means this function here is not only a function of x, but if p is can take can take on any continuous value, then really this function here is a function of p and a function of x. But that's perfectly legitimate if we can find functions like that. This here could be, we could think of our cp as just really just another function that depends only on p. So we could have it like that. That's perfectly valid. Now, what we're going to do is, and I think we're going to finish it in this uh, video, but Dirac said, yes, the eigenfunctions for the momentum operator, they are complete. And remember what they are, they have this expression. And then we have e to the i p divided by h bar x. And he said, yes, these are complete. This is a function of p and x, just like this is. So if I do the integration correctly, I can get out any function f of x. So in that sense, yes, they are complete. And what exactly does all that entail, though? And I don't think we're going to have time to cover that in this video. So let's stop the video right here, and we'll come back in the next video pick up on this point here then and see exactly what Dirac meant here by this term um, Dirac orthonormalization. So come back, join us in the next video, and let's finish this.